In this viscast, we're after to consider the motion of a uniform cylinder of mass m and radius r as it rolls smoothly down a ramp at angle theta to the horizontal. We're asked to find an expression for the linear acceleration of the centre of mass of the cylinder. A good starting point is to draw a diagram of the situation. So I have a ramp here at angle theta to the horizontal. And on the ramp, I have my cylinder. And what I want to find is the acceleration of the centre of mass of the cylinder. So that's the linear acceleration of the central point of that cylinder as it rolls down the hill. And so importantly, it's rolling smoothly down the hill, which means there's no kinetic forces of friction acting on my object, no sliding between the wheel and the surface. So there's two types of motion going on here. There's linear motion and rotational motion. So we have to satisfy both the linear form of Newton's second law, that the net force must be equal to the sum of the forces, which is going to equal the mass of my object times its center of mass acceleration. That's the thing we want to find. And also, the object's rotating, so we have to think about Newton's second law in the rotational form, that is the net torque which is acting on the object must cause some angular accelerations. The net torque is just going to be given by the rotational inertia of my object multiplied by the angular acceleration of the object. As the cylinder rolls down the hill, it will be rotating in a counterclockwise fashion. To begin with, let's start by putting the forces that are acting on my object, since I'm going to be using Newton's second law. And I remind myself that there's a weight force acting down, mg, and the weight force is going to have a component which is acting along the slope, and a component which is acting perpendicular to the slope. What other forces do I have acting? I also have a normal force from the slope that acts perpendicular to the slope and it will have the same magnitude as the component of the weight force here acting perpendicular to the slope. So there's that normal force. And finally, we also have a friction force. Now I said that there is going to be no kinetic friction, so the force of kinetic friction is going to be zero because there's no sliding. However, there can still be the force of static friction. In fact, that's necessary in order to cause a torque on my object. If I think about those two forces alone, the normal force and the weight force acting on my cylinder, they can't cause a torque. They can't cause any angular acceleration. The object won't rotate as is because the, but they both act through the center of mass of the object. The perpendicular distance is zero. So I have to add in a, another force here. This is my force of static friction. Uh, it's the force which provides the torque which is able to rotate the object. So they're the three forces which are acting on my, on my object, so we can put those down in our equations. Let's have a look at the linear equations, the net force um, acting, and we'll choose, first of all, just the x component. I don't think we have to worry about the y components. Let's choose x going down the plane. This angle inside here is theta. So down the plane in the positive x direction, I have m times g times the sine of the angle theta, because we want the opposite side, minus the force of static friction, Fs. Similarly, if we think about the torque equation here, what's the torque which is being provided? Well, the only force which provides the torque is the static force of friction, and so my torque is going to be the force times the perpendicular distance. That perpendicular distance is the radius of my cylinder, so I can say that uh, the torque will be the static force of friction times the radius, and that's equal to uh, my rotational inertia times my angular acceleration. Now, you may be tempted to think that you can put the static force of friction being equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force. However, recall that the static force of friction can be less than that or equal. The way to remember that is if I've got an object on a floor here and I push on it, well that means the static force of friction is going to act in the opposite direction. And if I increase 
the magnitude of my pushing force, then it just increases as well until at some point that I exceed my maximum static friction force and then I'll start to accelerate. So we don't want to lock ourselves into thinking that the static force of friction is necessarily the maximum that it can be. It just has to be big enough to cause the appropriate amount of angular acceleration such that the object rolls. So what I want to do here is take my two equations and I want to combine them and eliminate for SS since I don't know what that is. So let's uh, rewrite this as my um, mass times my acceleration of my center of mass. This is just equation one is equal to m times g times sine theta minus my, my static force of friction. And I'll use equation two to solve for that. That's just going to be i times alpha divided by the radius. Now at this point, because it's a cylinder, I might remind you that the rotational inertia of a cylinder is given by a half times the mass times the radius squared. So we can rewrite this as m acceleration of center of mass is equal to mg sine theta minus a half m r squared alpha over r. One of those radiuses cancels. We're also mass cancels from both sides. So this looks like this could be my expression for my acceleration of the center of mass coordinate. It's got all the quantities that I know, g, the angle theta, uh, there's still a dependence upon the radius r here, and alpha. So how can we eliminate alpha? Remembering for purely rotational motion, the tangential velocity is equal to omega times r. If I take the time derivative of this, we find that the tangential acceleration is equal to the angular acceleration times r. Similarly, for rolling motion, we remember that the velocity of the center of mass is equivalent to omega times r for rolling motion. By taking the time derivative, we can see that the acceleration of the center of mass is also equal to the angular acceleration alpha times r. Since r is a length here, it's not changing with time. That allows us to write alpha here as being equal to the acceleration of the center of mass divided by r, and that r on the bottom cancels with that final r on the top. And we can collect like terms, so if I take a half a center of mass across to the right hand side, I really have three halves. The acceleration of the center of mass is equal to g times sine of theta. And finally, the acceleration of the center of mass is equal to two thirds times g times sine of theta. So my linear acceleration only really depends upon how large my slope is. Do some assessment, my angle is equal to zero, then my acceleration of my center of mass is, is going to be equal to zero. So that's like my slope being horizontal, which seems perfectly reasonable.